Live from the Balls Visual Radio Studios, this is the Blades on Ball Show. And now, here's your host, the voice of South African rugby himself, Hugh Bladen. Hugh, it's over to you. Paul Simon, you can call me Al. I uh, went to see Paul Simon at Willis Park. Really fabulous show it was. Simon and Garfunkel. Talking to Kevin Leclerc uh, earlier this morning and saying that, you know, ha ha, I'm becoming a DJ. Yeah, Shane, I know we made a mistake about the Crusaders, but, you know, we're not infallible. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, you know, major fail. Sorry, Shane, we should have known the Crusaders had a had a bye, and they uh, certainly, we look forward to seeing them play because they really do play great rugby. Gustav Scumbi, het gesê, hy weet John Smith het a hond in a wedstrijder, um, and Victor Matfield had a hond in tien wedstrijder, and Percy is daard op, jy leis my weet nie hoeveel the wedstrijder hy gespeel het, well, ek moet vir jou sê, Gustav, hy het a hond in twee wedstrijder gespeel, and Jan de Koening, wat ook Afrikaans kan praat, ek moet a story vertel van Jan de Koening, ons was saam op tour met Henny Brandt, what the rugby scriver, scriver was. And we went to this little place called Peebles. Peebles is about 30 miles south of Edinburgh. And the spring of us was staying at a very Lani spa, and we were staying at a very nice hotel down in the little village of Peebles. Very Scottish. And uh, Jan and, and Henny and I went uh, walking down, meandering down the main street, the high street of Peebles, and found a, 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 a little pub. When I say it was a little pub, it held about 11 people. And uh, we sat down and ordered ourselves a lemonade. And um, we then uh, struck up a conversation with a young guy. He must be probably about 24 years old. He had a broad Scottish accent, and he played scrum half for the Peebles second team. And he was very impressed that we were there to cover the Springbok tour and were commentating and writing about the rugby and the whole thing. And I was having the, quite a long conversation with this lad who had a very broad Scottish accent. And Jan <laughs> and Henny were sort of you know, looking a bit bewildered and, and not quite uh, sure. I was catching every fourth word. Sort of out of, out of five words, I would, I would catch four out of five words. Uh, because this guy's accent was so broad, and, and eventually Henny Brunt nudged me, and he said to me, he said, Huey, weet jy wat jy die ookie praat? <laughs> and uh, Jan sort of, it, it's Sam Gestem, and uh, it was quite amusing, because they, uh, Henny Brunt didn't have a clue what the guy was saying. The guy was speaking English, but he just couldn't, uh, couldn't understand him. Um, also, somebody, uh, I, I didn't quite get the name, asked when FM was on. Can you pick that up, Simon? Yeah, I'm going down. Because we like, here we go, Keegan, Keegan Hodgson. Keegan Hodgson. Keegan, thanks for your tweet. Um, we gain on the 4th of March on FM. Can't quite tell you what the station is at the moment, but apparently Darren will reveal all this afternoon. So that will be... Uh, one for the FM for Bulls Radio. It's someone? nice. Yeah, yeah, it's great for us. I mean, we'll hit double-digit listeners for the first time. It's going to be lacquer. That'll be great. Yeah. What else? We got. Uh, we will be t- uh, calling Kevin Leclerc in a few minutes. They, you know, the Lions are, have had this challenge, and I'm going to talk to him about the the Southern Kings game and the fact that it was an early game. And they had a fabulous, a, a, I'm going to stop using the word fabulous. They had a great crowd. And uh, I sort of almost, in a way, put it down to being early, early afternoon. Because afterwards, Sid Nomis and I were sitting, just watching the crowd on the field, because all the players come out and they sign autographs and everything. And there were hundreds of kids on the field. It was really fabulous to see. So we're going to... Uh, I asked Simon if he had Horse With No Name by America. Brings back memories of a great mate of mine who passed away last year. Uh, He was in South Africa, played for the Wanderers Club, Peter Costa, and uh, was a really bright guy, and then uh, just passed away. 
and he loved Horse With No Name by America. It's amazing, America are still gain. They were, uh, that hit Horse With No Name was in the Hello? 1970s and they still are performing live. Is Kevin on the line? Hello? Yes, lady, late. Kevin! How's it? Yeah, I'm very well, thanks, Kev. How are you doing? Are you well? Good, good, thanks, Blades. Good, good, thanks. Do you want to call me on the landline, Blades? Or we on no, you're right. You're live on Balls Radio, Kev. So we've got you <laughs> live on <laughs> on Balls Radio. And it's great of you to uh, have agreed to chat to us. I'm going to give you a bit of yeah. a sales talk. Uh, you know, not only did Kevin play... Test rugby for South Africa, over 100 games for the Lions, also played for the Sharks, and it was in those days. And Kevin, now president of, of, the, of the Golden Lions Rugby Union, I always say I take my hat off to every president of every rugby union because having been in rugby administration, I was in rugby administration for about 21 years, uh, including being uh, chairman of, of the Wanderers Rugby Club. And, you know, Kevin Leclerc, guys and girls out there on Bulls Radio, does not get paid for what he does. Um, and, you know, these guys are, do it for the love of rugby and for the fact that they spend their lives trying to cut, find money to pay the professional rugby players. And I hope, you know, very often, sometimes I sort of think the professional rugby players don't quite grasp that, that, you know, your, your administration and that guys like your player. Anyway, Kevin, that's the, that's the sales spiel for you, my mate. We played together. <laughs> Kevin came Thanks, straight man. out of the under-20 side, the Transvaal under-20 side. I have to confess I'm a little bit older. And Kevin came straight as a lock forward, straight out of the under-20s into the Transvaal senior side, which uh, was a very rare occurrence, particularly for a young uh, a lock forward. So Kevin was, was that good, and we, we played, I think, two seasons together until I decided to call it a day. And uh, Kev, Thanks. great. Uh, how are things going with the Lions? No, great. Thank you, Blades. And thanks so much for that wonderful introduction. <laughs> and, and, you know, um, you were saying you were an administrator for 26 years. Also a great servant of the game, Blades, in all respects. And still today you are. And at that time you, you got uh, probably less than what I got, which is nothing. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure it's a case of, yeah. But, you know, um, often people ask me that question, eh, Blades, and, and I say to them, you know, you know, um, we we had wonderful administrators like yourself, like a Jan Lortz, like an Avril Milan, like a Mickey Haber, you know, that served the game for us, you know, very diligently and without... Like the uh, recently departed Louis Lake too. Yes, Doc Lake as well, you know, without complaining uh, too much about anything, they just got on with the job. You know, all, all often it's uh, so much the case, Blazers, that, you know, one does only come to appreciate these people that had administered the game all long after they had gone and departed or when you've moved on in your life into those roles yourself. So, you know, somebody has to do the job, I suppose, you know, and, and I'm just thankful that I have the time to do that. And it's a great privilege and honor for me to be able to serve, serve Lions rugby, as I have done now for 44 years. Yeah, well, I, I can tell you that I know there are a lot of people who are thankful that you do have the time and the inclination, the big factor, the inclination to to do this job, which is a, is a pretty thankless job. And Winnie, your dear missus, uh, certainly gives up a lot of your time, well, you know, a lot of your time with her. And, and we, we can't do these things without our beloved wives. That's Kev, so um, so how, the Lions challenge, I mean, I think it's gone really well. And, and culminating the last game that you played against the Southern Kings, where you won the game. Admittedly, the Kings weren't there with their full strength side. But it was an early afternoon game. I thought, you know, with close on 20,000 people there. It was really great. Pleasure. Thanks very much. Yes, it, it certainly was. And, and, and you know, thank you. We, we've, um, you know, as I said to you, and you were very close to the whole action that was going down at the Lions, is that we had to get on with the business of, of trying to keep our, our business active. Hence, we put this, this tournament together, which is a, a pretty, pretty uh, substantial one. Maybe not quite the same caliber as Super 15, but it's a different brand of rugby, I think, that we're serving up for the public. They're seeing different entities, different styles. I mean, Russia, you've got the French coming up. And, you know, coming back to the Kings game, 
um, yeah, you know, there was a lot of interest around that. Automatically, there would have been. But, you know, we played an earlier game as well, Blades, and which enabled us, I suppose, to bring in a lot of the school school children, the school youngsters, to come and watch. Oh, well, it was and, great. You know, it if was I can absolutely say, great. Maybe we've got to reconsider this, the times that we play these games. You know, 7 o'clock games in the evening on a Friday is, is, is not, not truly conducive to, to hosting hosting rugby rugby matches. Kev, and the, the, where to now? Where the, aren't you off to America? Basically, we play on the 16th of March. We're supposed to play in Namibia on the 23rd, but they, they've they um, uh, withdrawn, it seems. Um, they, they don't seem to have a strong enough side to take us on, but uh, that's still under negotiation. And then on the 16th of March, we play a French side called Montemarsan at Ellis Park. And then, then on the 13th of April, we we play the U.S. Invitational. A couple of days before that, we leave for, for California. Uh, and then there's another U.S. Invitational side, two similarly barbarian-type sides, uh, Beatty, uh, in Vancouver. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, which, we, which the guys are really, really, really looking forward to. It's also a nice experience. A lot of the chaps haven't been to America. And I think it'll be a lovely experience for them. I think uh, I've taught clever. Our ex um, Luce Ford that played for us two three years ago is, is actually due to lead one of those sides. Okay, right. I, yeah, one remembers Todd Clever with the long ponytail. Yes, played for right, Canada right. in the World Cup. Yeah. yeah, that's right. But if I can just add to that, you know, on the eleventh of May we play our Gen. I mean, I think you and I toured France in seventy three with our Gen, and you know when we won the Curry Cup in seventy two. Uh, and we we'd beaten everybody in France, and we got to gin, and as they quite often do, they invite players from all over France. And <laughs> yeah. we ended up playing virtually a test side, and they gave us quite a quite a hiding that day. <laughs> <laughs> they they, they pass masters are doing that, the French. But <laughs> yes, Kev, yes. I, I'm not sure whether our listeners know, but I mean, give us give us a little bit of a rundown on, on the on the program and the life. Of a of a professional rugby player from almost from the time I know you know some of the 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 unions are contracting schoolboys and then the guys are coming in. I th- I think it's a little bit of a shame because some of those kids might come in and buy an injury will never play a club game in their entire rugby career. But just give our listeners a bit of a rundown and then the the sort of weekly program if you have the time for us. Certainly, I will certainly do that, Blades. Um yeah, the game's changed somewhat to the day when you you were played with that much um, successful and vaunted uh, wondrous side, and I also had the privilege of playing with the Diggers side in the, in the late 60s and 70s. You know, and we were very much fortunate to play to field something like 14 of the Transvaal side. From yeah, the seven club, Springboks, I think uh, you had with, in your side. With seven Springboks in the side as well. You know, the emphasis was very much on 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 club rugby, but the game's changed so much in the professional era. Blades in that, you know, the, the scouts start to source the players actually from the school benches, hey, and they go and watch these different tournaments that these youngsters play in, and they, they, you know, might land up, you know, studying at the university, playing the odd game for the university or the odd club, but predominantly they will be contracted to the unions. From under 19s to under 21s, and then into the Vodacom sides, and then into the into the uh, senior sides. So quite rightly, he doesn't get exposed to that culture that you and I, unfortunately, or fortunately, were exposed to. In those yeah, days, yeah. You know, which, which actually taught you so so much about rugby, so much about your camaraderie. Not to say they don't have it now, but they're right into those ranks. And then you know, let's say their day they would comprise of of a eight o'clock start probably with a with a discussion with the coaches about the activities uh for the week. Um predominantly I suppose the coaches would also have their programmes worked out for that whole week or for that whole month basically. So they'd know that they'd have a field session or a gym session or there'd be a skill session or there'd be a motivational session. So these youngsters are pretty much in it from, from eight in the mornings till five in the afternoons. Um literally four or five days a week uh, blades. So they, so they they really they really have a, 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 a one could say a tough time of it, but it's you know it's the, the occupation I suppose, eh? Which yeah, sure. It, you know, it, it might. I, I suppose it, it's up to the coaches and the fitness trainers and that sort of thing to try and keep monotony out of the situation. 
That's absolutely the case, eh, Blades? Most most definitely is, eh? You know, I see now we've got a bit of a break now. If I can just uh, just discuss with you a bit about the Super 15 competition, you know, um, maybe for some a bit monotonous, but a very, very tough competition, to say the least. And it's virtually a test every week that you're playing in. Now, that puts your whole system under immense, immense stress in terms of, you know, organization, in terms of funding, in terms of motivation of your teams. I think trying to keep them on the field as well, you know, Blaise, from, from uh, an injury point of view. Yeah, you know, yeah. Last year, we suffered tremendously as a line, something like 25 fairly serious, serious, serious injuries. So that's, that's the whole, I think, the, the, um, the drive and the requirement of a Super 15 side, hence I say a side that is coming new into a competition must really have their act together because, boy, there's, there's a lot of pressures that are exercised or brought to be on, on that, that union yeah. to participate in this competition. Kev, did you get to That's see any time, of the Super thing. Rugby? Uh, I think Did play. you get over the weekend, did you get to see any of the Super Rugby? But I saw, obviously we all went and had a look at the, the Kings um, Western Force game. What did you think? And, and uh, you know, I, I'm going to sound very biased if I do comment, you know, Blakey, but I thought it was a, was a very low standard, of extremely low standard. Uh, but, you know, the Kings won. Good luck to them. I think it's a start for them. I think the, the, the Western Force certainly missed Pocock, they missed um, Nathan Sharp. And one or two of the other players, and it seems to have affected them quite quite dramatically. But um, yeah, no, it's it's a start. It's a start, and then I think any any win the person will take. You know, if I think back to our, our, our Jan Lotz, which you also you know, were coached by, was that the famous saying, Blazy? If it's you win, look at the score. But even if it's one point, you know you've won. Doesn't have to look pretty as long as you won it. <laughs> yeah, I I think yeah. that you know just watching the game quite closely that. Uh, both sides are going to battle a little bit in this year's Super Rugby. Yeah. yeah. No, with, with respect, I, I, I would say so, but one never knows that, Blazy. But the, the other game, the Bullstormers, for me, um, went around very much, and I think you might have described it at the outset, around the fly-offs. Or yeah. Not worded it. Yeah. It went about the fly-offs. And I think uh, Mornay really put his foot down and, and, and stated clearly that he's, he's the king of that, that, that park on that day. I well, it was interesting, Kev. Suffering a bit. Yeah, it was interesting because you had Loftus first fell stain against Yankees, and then you know at the Free yeah. State Stadium, the other big game of the weekend, you had Lambie against Hurson. And I mean, there's no question that yeah. I think Pat Lambie. I, I there was a little period in that game because we've just spoken to Bob Skinstat, and he, you know, he yeah. was covering the game, and he said suddenly Hurson yeah. started to run and distribute the ball, and they came right back into the game. But from what I That's saw, true. the majority of the game, Pat Lambie definitely had the upper hand. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely, I do agree with that, Blades. You know, we, we're in a very fortunate and blessed position to have the amount of flowers on hand that, we, that we've got. I don't know if you can recall, you know, at one stage in South African rugby, I think you had something like 10 different lock forwards you could pick from <laughs> for your <laughs> national, national side. Mm. And I think we, we're very fortunate to be in that position with our flyers at the moment. You know? And Kwesen, I think, is a, he's, he's a great player. Landy, for me, is a consummate guy with his skills. With yeah. his handling and his whole temperament, he's, he's a consummate guy, and he's he's going to be the go-to man, I think, for South Africa fly-off in the future. When he, when Mornay Mornay's still, I think, a very accurate, very professional rugby player. And if he can just get his act together, I think he could serve us for another year or two, Blatty. Yeah, he's uh, kicking he out. Of, are you, I mean, he's definitely lamp lamp. Yeah, his kicking out of hand was Mornay Staines was really good. You know, some tactical yes, kicks that were, that were really, you know, outstanding. The Bulls fought, I think, on the day, despite, you know, the kicks that, that, that Alton missed, I think dominated and then gave him the right sort of go, go forward ball uh, blades that enabled him to uh, you know, keep the, the Bulls Dominate back the game, yeah. all the time, which Nas was famous for doing. You know? Yeah, sure. So uh, that, that's where more is good. But, uh, you know, when he's under... under and the stress from his back, if he's not getting the right ball, I, I'm not quite sure how he will perform. Now, where for me, Lambie will make the most of a situation like that. And he will he will t- turn that into to an attacking position. Now, I've got a great 
that regard for that youngster. I think he's yeah, going to I, be a I think <clears throat> I, I also think you know he's a really good player. I did express the opinion that at the top, top, top level, you know, you you get you get internationals and class in world class internationals. And sure. I did make the point sure. that I wondered whether Patrick Lambie was just quick enough to be, you know, a world world class player. It's 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 absolutely a, a great observation, that Daisy. You know, it, it's at that level. It's all about speed, eh? And then I think this is probably when New Zealand have got to march, Sterling to march on everybody. Uh, and I wonder if we'd analyse uh, our comparative figures to the New Zealanders in terms of pace. And for me, the difference is we still command, um, let's say, scrums and lineouts and strength tactics. But in terms of the movement of the ball, which is all about the modern game, I think the All Blacks are beating us on, on pace. And maybe Lambie, but he's still young. He could pick up on that, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. But he's certainly got all the skills. I mean, I, I'm a great admirer of the way he, he plays. Kevy, um, so the boys are off to America. Oh, no, they're, first of all, they play at Ellis Park. In fact, I think Mont I'm doing that at Mont de, Ma de Maison. Mont, Mont, is it? Mont de Maison on the, on the 16th of March. On the 16th yeah, of March. We might still go to Namibia on the 23rd of... No, that's already gone. We might still have another game coming up in the interim because we, uh, we got one against the Pumas, which is a stopgap. Yeah, yeah. And then I'll say that there's Montemassant at Ellis Park, and then we move off to, to, to America. Yeah, well, so yeah. you Lions fans and supporters, the Montemassant, the highly rated French side, club side, but, yeah. you know, they, they tend to load their teams, do the French when they come out in terms of a club side. Absolutely. And great uh, entertainment, do, it should be. So, so get along to Absolutely. Ellis Park on, on the 16th of March. Kev, thanks so much for your time. Uh, I say I'm sitting here on Bulls Radio. We've seen how our morning, Monday morning sports chat is, is going along. And, uh, you know, what a privilege to, to, that you agreed to talk to me. And, and thanks for your time. It's always a pleasure for me to chat to you, and good luck to you on your new venture with Balls Radio. <laughs> Thanks uh, a lot, uh, Kev. I'm sure it's going to be a great, great success, Blazy. All the best, Dave Blades. Thanks, cheers. Cheers, Kev. Cheers, Dave Blazy. Bye, Blades. The Fray, How to Save a Life. Wow, it's fun being a DJ. <laughs> Learn a lot from Simon Hill, and, and uh, some, my son-in-law said to me last Sunday, because we've done this now sort of fortnightly, and my son-in-law, I spoke to him about it. He said, don't tell me you chose the music. And uh, I do choose one or two. And Kevin Leclerc said to me when we were off the air, he said, of course, the music of the 70s, the Beatles and Elvis and the Rolling Stones and, and those guys had uh, some fantastic music. And now we've got, uh, you know, Adele, I think Adele's great. Uh, I watched a bit of the Grammy Awards and and Fun is a band that seems to have uh, caught the eye, although they seem to be slightly older guys. Fun was a band that that seemed to receive uh, quite a few awards. Morena Duval, thanks for your tweet. I'm pleased that you find uh, some of the stuff that I say amusing. And, uh, of course, the, Hello, uh, I wonder if some of you didn't... Oh, we've got Dave Usendorf on the line. Dave! Yes, sir. How's it? How's it? This is Blades. Blades on balls. Hello, big boy. <laughs> How are you? I'm very well, and you? You're, no, you're, 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 live, you're live on Balls Radio, thanks to Simon Hill and Darren Scott. And... Uh, Dave, uh, just a few words. I, you know, I think I think match play golf is fabulous to watch. I mean, we've seen the Ryder Cup, and we've seen this World Golf Challenge. I mean, it, it, wasn't it fantastic? I think it's fantastic that we've sort of revisited where golf actually evolved from in terms of match play. You know, we've got so accustomed to the players playing stroke by event. So when you do have a match play event. I think sometimes from a TV perspective, it takes a little bit long, especially when we witnessed the final last night and you're only focusing on two players. But that's the real way golf evolved, and it was excellent to watch and great quality golf. Yeah, you know, the first of all, you know, 
Davy, um, I mean, ridiculous weather conditions. I mean, th- that first night, I was watching that first night, rain, sleet, and then the next thing is, the place was just white, 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 in the middle of the desert. Well, that's crazy. That's like having a sort of heat wave in the Antarctic, which is, uh, <laughs> which is really strange. But, of course, you know, for me, was was to see how certain players would adapt to that and tell you the the South Africans aren't with, you know, used to that conditions. To see Georgie Kitsia with a beanie and a jacket and another jacket and rain suit. And so he really battled in those conditions. But, you know, definitely that's what golf's all about. Sometimes we get, again, get used to playing in idyllic conditions. We're sitting here at, uh, at Copper Leaf, the Owls Club, getting ready for the 20 open and it's overcast and there's big smiles on all the European spaces because it looks like it might rain. So the adaptability around an event like that encompasses much more than just golfing skills. Yeah, and one might say, well, first of all, I mean, it was brilliant for us to have the sec, us South Africa to have the second most players from any country after America. I mean, absolutely, seven of them, hey? Yeah. Well, it just shows how the game is growing. And, and uh, to have from the one extreme, in this case, uh, Ernie Els, who's really set it up with his great performances over the last couple of years and, and pulled the, the youngsters along, and then to see the latest guys, uh, um, Grace and, and Kutsia in, in the mix, Tim Clark sort of solidly doing his business, and of course uh, Louis and, and Charles, just two phenomenal players. So yeah, it was, it was fantastic to see all the guys playing, and uh, there's no reason that should, should stop, because uh, next thing, Sterney's made himself, you know, got himself into that field as well through his great performances recently, Yeah, and uh, yeah. there's no doubt he's going to move into the top 50 in the world soon too, so yeah, it's all good for South African golf. And uh, how's young Thomas Aitken doing? Well, Thomas is is, is uh, quite an unknown phenomenon because he obviously won in Spain just over two years ago. He's such a talented player. He's got all the shots. He's he's done it before he's won. And uh, I think he's he perhaps hit a, a little bit of a, a non-focused period. You know, he recently got married, beautiful wife. Um, he's been living it up in Barbados, having some fun, which he duly deserves. Yeah. But uh, Tom is a great player, and he'll be back, and I'm sure he's gonna he's gonna win some tournaments. So we've got a host of young players that are really doing well. And then, of course, to see Jakob and Sale win this weekend in the Dardata, that also is, is an important step for him because he's a, he's an exceptionally good player, and uh, he'll be out uh, at the uh, 20 Open again this week. So, yeah, you know, it's, it's great to see the young South African guys that are really you know making their mark in the world of golf. Davey, yeah, it's, it, and, you know, it's fantastic to see the guys coming through in the game that you spend so much time promoting. But one's got to say a little bit disappointing for the South Africans in the world match play. I think it is a little bit disappointing, but there's quite a few things to take into consideration, and it's not an excuse by any stretch of the imagination. But firstly, the tournament is held on the other side of the world. The players are out in South Africa, it's effectively harvest time for them with all these wonderful co-sanctioned events, huge amounts of money to be played for. Then to jump on the plane and fly halfway across the world, yeah. totally different conditions, different climate. And sometimes I think the preparation perhaps uh, was a little lacking for many of them in terms of that. I know some of them were out there early. Uh, the guys didn't play in the Africa Open. I'm talking about George and, and Gracie. They went straight out there. Sterney. Um, played nicely and went straight off to the Joburg Open. So they did go and have a bit of preparation, but how do you go to the desert and prepare, prepare for a snowstorm? I think that, <laughs> that probably put them all a little bit off. But the more they do it, the more chances they're going to have. And they're competing with some exceptionally good match players in uh, Polter. Hunter Mahon obviously has won that tournament a couple of times, as has Polter. And, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's all a process. We, we have such high expectations as South African spectators yeah, that that's every true. week one of our guys is going to win. But um, those are the top 66 players in the world. Obviously, Snedeker and, and Mickelson didn't play. It is uh, allocated to the top 64. But well, are, one and two, one and two players. go out in the first round. They're making a habit of that, unfortunately. <laughs> so um, we might see Michael with some new club suit. Do you think? You no, know, that's a good point, Davy. You know, new clubs. You just signed this unreal deal with Nike. Um, I mean. Can that be a real factor? If so, what happens if if he actually finds that he can't use the clubs? Well, I don't think it's the clubs. I don't think it's the clubs because those guys could probably get it done with a with a spade. But I think the problem is that the expectations around Mackerel. Mackerel has done extremely well on his own, getting himself to number one, pretty much 
low-key, enjoying himself, having a great time. Now he signed this huge deal, which has got a whole lot of other obligations. He's yeah, got to attend yeah. functions. He's got to go and, you know, shake hands and kiss babies in the mall. He's got, so his whole responsibility in terms of being a golfer has changed quite significantly. And I think it'll take him a little while to adapt to that. And that's where I think sometimes, in my opinion, sports agents can be a little bit offside because they've now got him into this deal. Granted, he's made more money, but he's, on his own, he's made more money than he can ever spend. So whether he needs another $250 million or not, that's always questionable. The problem is now these other obligations have taken his eye off the ball and he's not performing. So immediately he's under extra pressure because um, he hasn't gone out and won with his, his first round with his new clubs. So the clubs won't be the issue. I think the issue is all the peripheral yeah, obligations. Yeah, all the obligations, probably, probably not practicing quite as much as he did and that, that type of sure, thing. Sure, you know, I think back to... So you did inter- interrupt you there, um, uh, Trevor Immelman. Of course, Trevor was a fantastic golfer. 2008 won the Masters, unbelievable. And then subsequent to that, he was he just went nowhere. Okay, granted he did get an injury, but in that process he had he got the freedom of New York. He was on the Letterman Show. He had to fly up to Oregon to the NAC headquarters and go and do stuff there, play golf with this guy and that guy. And understandably, you know, his whole life changed. And and I think unfortunately. So did his his whole career path, and unfortunately, yeah. again, mm. we haven't seen him around for a while. So, you know, those are things that that nobody can prepare these players for. The amount of money that gets thrown at them once they succeed, when they when they're on the up and up, they can't get a free glove or a sleeve of balls. <laughs> but once they're doing well, yeah. you know, it's not going to the bank. When you need the money, they don't want to help you. And when you've got some money, they offer you all kinds of fancy things. Yeah. So I suppose that's that's just the the process, you know. But. Uh, I think uh, I think McElroy is talented, determined enough, and and proud enough to overcome these things. And uh, perhaps he needs to just put his foot down in terms of what obligations these sponsors are creating for him. Yeah, I'm sure. Just to get back to that world, I, I, I take it you from what I, I'm list, I'm hearing that you did watch last night's uh, final. Did you? My guy was Hunter Mayhem. Once the South African guys had fallen out, I actually said to my wife, yeah. I was watching Hunter Mahan and he looked so on top of his game. And uh, I just said to my wife, I think this guy is going to win. But, uh, I, and I didn't see the final. The Matt Kuchar must have actually come through pretty well. Unfortunately, I just caught the end of it because I'd been in the Drakensburg. Uh, but Matt, Matt Kutcher played exceptional golf. I think Hunter Mahon had also some extra responsibilities, defending champion, the hopes of, of all America. I'm not a big Hunter Mahon fan, um, and I was really glad to see Matt Kutcher win it because Matt Kutcher is, firstly, he's a great guy. He's got a unique swing, which he's made work for him. So it sort of defies some of the, the, the stories that we hear on a continual basis, how you have to have this perfect swing. He's got a funny putting stroke with an extended putter. He's, uh, but he's got guts and determination, and he, and he ground out a, a wonderful victory against the guy who had done it before. So the quality of golf was the winner at the end of the day, and, uh, and it was a great spectif- spectacle for golf, and it sets up the year because, of course, the next big event is around the corner of the Masters, and yeah. lots of people start speculating as to who's going to win that and why and how. So, um, yeah, it, it was a good event. I was glad that Kucha won, I must say. Davey, thanks. Yeah, now, uh, tell us about the Swanee Open. Well, it's really exciting, uh, Blades. We've got the, the course has been set up magnificently. The ground staff have done a fantastic job. Um, we've had a few setbacks with the weather in, in terms of excessive amounts of rain, but just overcome that. The course is a buzz with, with the players have arrived from all over the Europe. Um, guys have come up from, obviously, the Dardotte last week, and uh, they're all out here practicing uh, the, the setup of the golf course, the facility has been exceptional. Twani have been wonderful in their marketing uh, campaign. It's been on the radio and television. So we're expecting a lot of people out there. There's hospitality areas for everyone. It's 50 bucks a day, so you can come and really enjoy watching some of the great players. The nice thing for me is there's a lot of unknowns. You know, in South Africa, we always expect it to be Rory McIlroy, Tiger Woods, and Luke Donald. It's <laughs> not the case this week. Um, there's, but there's a lot of young players that are doing exceptionally well. A lot of South Africans making their mark in world golf through these co-sanctioned events. And, uh, and of course, the Europeans out there. There's 78 European players, 78 South African players. And um, you know, it's going to be an exciting week. The course is magnificent. It's a long golf course, so I would imagine some Tell of the people are going to have a slight <laughs> advantage. 
Um, it's too long for you off the back, lad. You'll have to give you a, <laughs> uh, two hits and a throw. <laughs> I know, well, you but, know, um, I played there no. not that long ago, and I mean, it's a good hit from T to fairway. And long grass yeah. in between. Luckily, I drove the ball quite well that day. But it is a, it's a long course. Yeah. So get yourselves the out. The flexibility I mean, of the course. Yeah. Beg your pardon? No, you say? The, no, the flexibility of the course allows for us to accommodate you when you're playing a Farmers Weekly on Wednesday afternoon. All these great players that are coming out to challenge the, the course record in a big championship. So there's a bit of something for everybody when you're playing the course. The greens are going to be a, a little quicker. Um, nice and quick and firm for the play so it's going to be a great week of golf and uh, you've got a bit mm. of time you've got to get out to to the Elf Club the Club Belief and, and come and enjoy some of the golf yeah I'll get out there because I, I've watched a, a, a lot of golf you know primarily the PGA Championship when it was played at Wanderers but I've been to Houghton Live and to the obviously to Sun City for the for the million dollar and I, I can tell you guys and girls out there, it's really interesting to go out and watch golf live because the one thing that television doesn't give you is, is how far these guys actually hit the ball and how cleanly they hit the ball. And, you know, you lose, tele, one, unfortunately, one thing you lose in television is, is size, two is pace, yeah. and third is distance. And, I mean, they hit the ball so far, don't they, Davey? It's unbelievable. You know, that, that, that's one thing that is that is hugely impressive. But their short game, the way they can play bunker shots, exp- you, know, you know, get themselves out of difficult positions, is unbelievable. And that's that's something that they work tirelessly on on improving. It's great to see Darren Clark here won the British Open a couple oh, of years wow. ago. Oh wow! Yeah. Jose Maria Latovol. He's going to be uh, the Ryder Cup successful Ryder Cup captain in that wonderfully emotionally charged Ryder Cup that we all watched in in September last year. Uh, Simon Dyson's on his way back up. Robert Rocks here, and then of course the South African contingent head up by uh, Dalton De Silva. We've seen play well nicely. Trevor Fisher Jr. and of course Jakob and Salu won last week. JB Krug is going to be here, um, and there's a lot of local guys. Sean Norris from uh, from the area. He's been playing nice golf. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, it really is going to be an exciting weekend of golf. And there's not many opportunities in any sport for that matter where you can get so close to the players. Yeah, you get down to the driving range. You've got a beautiful range. You can sit there and watch the players warm up. And as I've mentioned already, hospitality area set up to to ensure that you have a little bit of nourishment before you head out onto the golf course. Um, so it's all set up for a great week. And, yeah, and wonderful. People should be in their droves coming and have a watch. Bring yeah, how do you get out to your kids out there? You know? Yeah, how do you, out Copperleaf, if you go out Nickel Highway, if you're coming from Pretoria, you're on the N14, aren't you? That's correct, John. It is signposted. So just past the Thatchfield Golf Course, a little Nashi course on your left, you see that across the bridge, a couple of k's and you're at Copperleaf, if it's out in the countryside, and uh, you know, it's going to be a wonderful week of golf. It is the last co-sanctioned event in South Africa before the players then build up to uh, the Telcom PGA, and then of course the Investec Cup, which has been quite a nice incentive for the players, playing in a, as many events as they can, getting points, and then they'll be off to play in a specialty event to uh, get a little bit of a bonus at the end of the season. Davey, it sounds like you're the tournament director. <laughs> no, I'm just um, one bounce up from the bag boy, but I'm trying my best, and we've got a great team here, and uh, we're very fortunate everyone's putting in a huge effort. So the tour, yeah, I mean, they're very efficient, and they've done this thing many times. All the support staff, you know, the, the guys who come out and put up the tents and the ropes, and Gary Todd heads up the tournament along with Mark Strip from the European Tour, um, no, so there's a very competent team on in place who will yeah, ensure that the tournament great. runs smooth. Super, yeah. Davey. Well, thanks so much for talking to us and giving us so much of your time. That uh, was Dave Usendorf. Cheers, Davey. Thanks so much for talking to us. Okay, Blaise. Keep it on the fairway. Cheers. <laughs> okay, bye. Well, that about wraps it up on uh, Blades and Ball on this on Blades on Balls on this uh, Monday morning. Hope you've enjoyed listening. And until next time, have a good one. That was the Blades on Ball Show. Join the voice of South African rugby on your wireless next Monday for more unbelievable memories and banter. Until then, stay classy, like 20-year-old Glenn Morangi classy.